Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that always keeps professional veneer. Well, actually, I think you'll find and... just... I... Oh. It's impossible to get a word in with this clown. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move straight on into our headlines tonight. Uh, and our first one from the Metro, a world-beating fiasco. 48,000 contacts are lost without a trace. What happened there, Rob? So yeah, this is the story um, that the UK is sort of starting to see its second wave of um, of COVID come through. I think that's fair to say, as we've seen a steady rising uh, number of cases. Uh, last time we were talking, the test and trace uh, system was under stress. Matt Hancock and uh, Boris Johnson were facing questions from Keir Starmer, basically saying that people had to drive very long distances to try and get a test. And there were worries that there weren't enough tests available. Um, now we've started to see more positive results come through, and uh, that was starting to worry people and worry what you know what the results of that might be. However, there was a slight dip, and everybody thought, "Oh, we might be over this." Um, As I say, I mean, I'm using one of these apps, uh, which is part of a study where you self-report so that they can try and, you know, if you then get infected, they'll they'll get an idea of what kind of symptoms you had in the lead up to it. And it kind of gives you a summary of what's happening in the UK this week uh, at the top of the app when you open it. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you know, trending downwards, lo- looks like things are getting under control. And it was like, oh, well, that's good. You know, we had these extra restrictions come in and they seem to be working. Seems seems like we've, we've, you know, we can get through this because if you can kind of put measures in, take them off, put them on, like until we have a vaccine, that seems like a reasonable way to go about life with some annoyances, but it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, yeah, so that was the theory behind it anyway. Um, but then it was later discovered that um, 48,000 uh, contacts had actually been lost or not reported correctly. Uh, and even maybe more disturbingly, the, the fact that this data was stored in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, not I even just an Excel spreadsheet, not a .xlsx file, uh, as most people will be used to these days, but in a .xls file, which is a format that has been defunct since 2007. Um, well, we can go into the technicalities here. It's, it's, it's sou- it sounded bad, and then it got worse uh, when I read the story. If you know more about the technicalities than I do, go, go ahead. Then, you know, what... Because all I understand about the, you know, the test and trace system, and as, as the Metro headline suggests, a world-beating fiasco is their sort of subheading to the... Uh, so the yeah you know the forty eight thousand we've been told from the start that this will be a world beating track and trace system and every failure that seems to happen with it seems to reinforce the message that it really isn't. Um, I've gone so far as just to download the official NHS app on my phone, but do you know more about like the technical side of that and how all the data is being stored in the background? Well, so okay, so I think there's several things going on. The, the phone the phone app works on an API that's been developed by Apple and Google. Um, because the original thing when the government like we're going to do our own app was that the problem with that is that means the government literally has access to your data do you trust the government with that data about where you've been all the time i think most people would tend towards no especially after various things that have happened this summer people are like we don't want the government knowing that much about me and that's had a knock-on effect even now it's using this api that's been developed by google and apple but basically the way it works, and it's actually quite interesting. I noticed on my phone, you can go into the features, you can turn turn off the core feature that's underneath the app, uh, and it obviously the app would stop working. But it, you can go in and you can see all the times it's logged you being near someone for fifteen minutes, uh, like within two meters. So you can it'll be like you know did a log, did a log, and you can't get any other information other than the log happened at that time. And what they do is they save a unique ID which can be traced back to the other person but knows no other information about them it basically this means these two devices were within two meters of each other for 15 minutes at, and they know the time that it happened but that's not like that does that doesn't have a gps location it's based on your bluetooth um but but that's the app is a, a side issue to this thing here i mean i think the the way the app is currently set up i think everyone should download it and use it and i think of the problem is that some people are not trusting it because of the earlier attempts uh but i've seen it being fine the only thing that's a bit weird about the app is that it tells you it has a notification which is like you may have been near someone who uh you know but basically that like someone has gone for a test or something and it's like oh it remember knows and this is built in part of the apple ios 
So a built-in part of the Google slash Apple functionality where it pings you this notification. If you click on it, it takes you to the app and there's no more information. And a lot of people were confused over that because they were like, oh, if I got COVID, do I have to self-isolate? And it's, you only have to self-isolate if you get the specific notification that tells you that. So there's two types of notification. I think the first time you get it, you know, it goes, oh, warning, COVID app. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to have to stay at home for 14 days. So uh, I think that's an important uh, thing to be aware of. But the technical thing about this, which is interesting. So the issue with the track and trace is you have to store a lot of information um, for uh, and, and more information is coming in. And especially as you start to have a spike, that information, the sheer amount of information you have to store on the people you're tra uh, tracking and tracing, because you're going to have to at least have their name, their address the places they were, you know, you have, that's a fair amount of information to store. So I'm not saying it's the easiest problem in the world, but there are a lot of people who deal with databases of information that could be employed uh, to deal with this. And one would assume if you've hired a company to do it, they would have some developers who know what they're doing with this. Uh, seems like that was not the case because they were using an Excel spreadsheet instead of any number of database uh, things that exist out there and are quite easy to send, like, that you can normally get a basic working one done in a few hours uh, if you've never done it before by following a guide online, as long as you have some computer coding experience. Um, getting it to do everything you want, sure, might take a little bit longer, but given how long they've had to implement this, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that you could employ one or two decent developers and, and they would have done it by now. Um, yeah, sure, there'll be bugs, but that's software. Um, <laughs> and um, then, uh, so instead of doing that, they used an Excel spreadsheet, which is already a bad idea. But then they used a really old version of Excel, which is like the compatibility mode that can still be opened in uh, before we had this cloud version of what, uh, Office, Office 365. Um, and so that's the .xls format as opposed to the .xlsx format. And because it's an older format, it has more limitations. And because of uh, Microsoft's backwards compatibility and all of that, you can't, you can't change limits on a thing like that because it has to be openable in the old software. Um, and so there's a limit of the number of rows and the number of columns. Um, and it sounds like, and this is the most bizarre bit to me, how do you store stuff in a table? If you're, if you're making a table, how do you store that information? Like just, just as a general question, if you were making a table, where would you put the headings and where would you put the data? I put the headings at the top and the data down the side, I guess. Exactly. That's the normal way of doing it. That's how Excel is designed. So Excel's limit of rows is a big number. It's like, I think it's like 160,000 or something. It's Probably, um, it's probably the maximum number you can store in two to the thirty-two or something like that, which is a standard limit of old software because that's how binary works. Um, thirty-two bit numbers. Well, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> it's accidentally become a tech podcast. But um, but yeah, like you 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 um have that that information. Um, and uh, so so yeah, rows. You can have a lot of rows. Columns, however, you can't have as many columns because people tend to use columns less. So when they were working out how much data they're going to store. They chose to have more rows than columns, a reasonable decision by Microsoft because reasonable people put headings at the top and put their data downwards. Now, for whatever reason, the people who designed this system did it the other way around. So the reason they actually ran out of uh, space is because they only had like 16,000 per spreadsheet. And on one day when they got more than like 16, I think it's 16,540 something. Um, once you get more than that many columns, all that other data was lost. And they didn't get like a message back saying, oh, you know, there's an issue with the data. So they must have been doing something automated to put it into a spreadsheet. Um, but yeah, that's what went wrong, basically. And uh, I very rarely like, you know, I know we can be critical of the government for things they do that, you know, but we can understand there's a lot of pressures on, on, on the government to do things, etc. And uh, on these companies. But there are very few situations where I feel like I could have done a better job, especially if you paid me 35 million, which I believe was the contract for this specific bit. Um, a lot of people are talking about 12 billion, which I think is the total Circo contract to cover a whole lot of bits of this track and trace app. But I believe, and I'm, I may be wrong, but well, from what I've seen, it was 35 million to cover this particular bit. If you'd paid me 35 million six months ago, I bet you I'd have got this done. And a lot of my friends who know how to program would be much richer now because I'd have just paid them like 2 million each for the t their time. And, and we'd be done, you know, like... Um, it's very rare, I feel, to be in a situation where I feel I can very clearly criticise and be like, I could have done this better myself. And this is one of those examples where it's like, oh, that's not hard. Um, I know a lot of people who are young and in software and Circo could have just hired three of them, especially during the pandemic when you want to be offering jobs to people who might have lost their job. <laughs> yeah, precisely. 
that is that, that is madder than I first thought. Then just that whole that rows and columns business kind of shows that it appears that they've made the wrong decision at every possible turn. There almost, yeah, like, yeah. That's wow. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I knew far too much about that particular issue because I've been following it. So I think we have two headlines that go together here. So from the uh, Metro, we have lockdowns are failing. And from the Express, we have it's very tough, but we have to stick with it, which I'm pretty certain is a line from the day to day. <laughs> it sounds like it is. It's, it's a line from Matt Hancock, actually. But I think those two things are interchangeable, really, um, with how well Matt Hancock's interviews go. Uh, so, yeah, so we've been talking about this second spike. And with that second spike comes the possibility of fresh lockdowns. We've already alluded to the fact that um, particularly in the north, there are areas and cities that are coming under stricter and stricter um, sort of legislation to try and tie them down. Um, and the big worry is that we could have another lockdown like we did at the start. And nobody is keen to do that. Um, I think it's fair to say that at the at the start, when this crisis happened and we all suddenly went into lockdown for those first six weeks, it was quite a harsh lockdown, but it's because we'd had zero restrictions before that and everybody could kind of understand why we had to put a hard stop on it it was a disease we didn't really we had very limited understanding of as well and nobody really knew there was no track or trace system even set up then so there's no way you could kind of like control or trace where it had been it was it was it seemed to be out there in the general public um now we're feeling like, yeah, there are different ways that we can put the brake on things. There are different ways we can lock down. We can, you know, we saw the government, for example, saying that pubs can't be open past 10 o'clock. Now, that's maybe not the most stringent lockdown measure. Um, COVID doesn't suddenly go away at 10 p.m. or come out at 10 p.m. It's not like a gremlin. Um, but, uh, but they're like small measures to try and do that. Um, what's worrying now, particularly, is that Criticism is starting to come from various corners within Parliament. So that Metro um, headline has a picture of Keir Starmer because Keir Starmer brought up the data in the House of Commons that said, look, these areas that are under lockdown had an R rate of this when the lockdown was put in place. And two weeks later, look, it's actually gone up more. The lockdown doesn't seem to be doing anything so why are we putting people under these restrictions if it's actually damaging to the economy and not having the effect that we wish it's having on the other side of the house you've got backbench conservatives who are growing in their frustration of the government's ability to handle this crisis and i think they're attacking it from generally like a more libertarian angle of oh my goodness isn't the government doing a lot to you know refrain people you know put limits on people's social liberties um we're uncomfortable with this and we know that our constituents are starting to get a little bit angsty about it and importantly for the conservatives um places which are spiking at the moment tend to be uh in the north of england and they are those traditional red wall seats um the ones that fell from labor and into the hands of the conservatives in the 2019 election uh, the Conservatives clearly feel that it's vital that they keep those seats on side if they want to maintain big majorities in the future. Because um, if they lose them now, then it's very possible that those seats will turn to Labour again for another generation. You know, if they've only just turned Conservative, you want to try and keep them on side. So the fact that they're failing to do so um, is a big worry for them. So that's why that first headline came from. That second one from Matt Hancock, it's very tough, but we have to stick with it kind of sums up the position of the cabinet and Boris Johnson. They're just saying, we've got to get our head down and, and get through this. Um, but I think time will tell how long the government, sorry, how long parliament will stay on side. They were meant to have a vote in the House of Commons on the next round of COVID restrictions. And that was pushed back to uh, Monday. Uh, the thought was there that it gives the government a bit more time to get the whips they need to try and drum up the Conservative support to get that bill through Parliament. Now it looks like Labour won't support it because Keir Starmer led with it in PMQs. Um, you might have expected um, Keir Starmer to stand with Boris Johnson on this fact because I think Keir Starmer has always said, look, we'll support lockdowns and we'll support the government when there is evidence and the science backs that up. Uh, 
So I think it was quite telling uh, on Wednesday when Keir Starmer specifically brought up those facts and just said, look, lockdowns, in our opinion, are failing. This is why we can't really support this bill. Uh, and in general, the the fact that COVID restrictions haven't really been voted on in the past is a new thing. And I just wanted to touch on it very quickly that I can't remember if I did it last time, but did you did you hear about the fuss Lindsay the, the the speaker Lindsay Hoyle made about a week ago about the way the government had treated COVID restrictions and sort of the big tongue lashing he gave the government? I think I heard. I don't think I have. Nah, let me start again. I don't think I heard any particular quotes, but I got the general gist of it. Yeah, it was kind of. I think there is even a meme of a Conservative MP going around saying, "Does nobody have any respect for this house?" Um, if I can find that. It's it's funnier than I make out. Oh, sorry. And anyway, Lindsay Hoyle, uh, the speaker last week, did come out and say, look, we've been quite lenient with the government and the way that you put this legislation in place because we understand that it's emergency. But now these things should really be debated in Parliament or at least put before the House of Commons before they are made um, public knowledge. Matt Hancock's restrictions can't be announced to the public first and then the House later was their point was because the house has to debate on it and say if this is the right thing um now you can debate if that's even you know in the case of emergency the government should have powers to shut things down completely i don't remember the lockdown for six weeks being voted on we were told it was happening and everybody went okay this is tough but now we've got to do it uh but now covid is more of a normal thing and something we have to live with and those restrictions we feel you know might need some, you know, how effective those lockdowns are now coming into question. They need oversight. And they need oversight and MPs feel that they need some form of debate rather than just bowing to the government's every wish every time they wish to lock down a bit of the country. So it'll be, it'll just be one other thing to look out for in Parliament. We've said that backbench rebellions are and, and U-turns are kind of what this government has been living with since March. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see if that is a, another U-turn the government's forced into or if they don't lock down places in the country as, as hard as possible um, because they fear, uh, one, the evidence doesn't back it up, and two, they fear it's ultimately a, a vote loser. Not that there's any, not that there's election anytime soon, but they really don't want to lose the faith of the supporters they recently um, were able to get the vote of just, yeah, eight months ago. Yeah, I'm not sure I really have much to add to that other than to clarify that there is indeed a quote from the day to day uh, when Peter O'Hanra O'Hanrahan uh, goes uh, to Germany and fails to interview the finance minister and so makes up the quote. He didn't like the deal, but he had to go along with it, um, <laughs> which is very, it's very close. <laughs> I was right. So, you know, uh, life imitating art. I think it's time to move on to our main story tonight, uh, sticking with the a uh, political theme we're going to touch on the debates uh in the US general election. So I think we have two debates to cover, don't we? We have both the presidential candidate debate, so Trump versus Biden, and then also there was the vice presidential debate which was uh Kamala Harris versus uh Mike Pence. Yeah, so uh let's start with the first one, the more important one people would see um you know between President Trump and his uh adversary uh, joe biden looking okay so looking back the history of presidential debates goes back to the first one uh you know first televised debate between kennedy and nixon and they've always been built up in the public psyche as you know two political heavyweights two titans going at it and it's kind of like if you want to know what american democracy is you look at those debates you know two people at the height of their profession battling it out uh in a chess game you know a big battle of wits uh unfortunately this one that was sort of like <laughs> this debate was one that was marred by interruptions and kind of a sense of this is where american democracy is now and you know i was unable to i'll say now i was unable to watch the debates in their entirety they are on at like two o'clock in the morning uk time which is something that i no, won't stay up for and if i have to watch it for two hours then it's going to be like quite a big drain and from the sounds of it that first debate was a really big drain for anybody who watched it because it was car crash television people you know you you have to watch because it's the debate so you, you can't look away um but 
the quality of debate wasn't there. There were several interruptions. Um, I don't have the stats for how much Biden interrupted Trump, but apparently Trump interrupted Biden 73 times, which is an awful lot. Uh, and it kind of was, it was marred by the moderator kind of failing to take control of the situation. I think even at one point he turned to Trump and said, look, when you, when you agreed to this, you said that Biden would get two minutes without an interruption. You're not abiding by those rules. They're rules that your own team agreed to so why don't you do that but then he didn't really follow up on it like he said i know he said that but like it, it didn't come through over the rest of it yes because i mean i guess for trump he feels that hey there are, there are no consequences i you know if, if there's a point i want to make i'm gonna say it that's the that's the trumpian style and i think this debate kind of showed that this is where it, trump has an ability to pull his opponents down to his level or that's what he's always trying to do it's these debates always remind me of the refrain of like when you're trying to have a debate online it's like playing chess with a pigeon it will knock the pieces over shit on the board and say that it's won anyway you know um and that is kind of trump's approach to debates i feel um i mean i i mean i think we could have predicted the interruptions from him against hillary like i remember like um there's the often used quote uh, when they go low we go high right so that's kind of what hillary tried to do hillary tried to have a reasonable conversation with him and he spoke over her uh, people were very annoyed especially i mean it's it's bad anyway but doubled with the fact that she was a a woman candidate um and that that is a problem in workplaces all across the world where women are generally talked over so it was like doubly bad from that point of view um but to the people who were voting Trump, they were like, oh, well, you know, he was out there. He was bullish. He was everything we wanted him to be. Um, so that didn't end up helping Hillary at all, really. Um, so I, I don't think the interruptions are surprising. I think what I was probably surprised about was like how Biden reacted in response to that, which, as you say, being brought down to his level was you kind of thought that's like that's not what Biden's going to do. But in some ways, him being combative, I think, was probably important because otherwise he would have get got completely walked over. Yeah, Um the the big quote that stood out is like the the will you shut up man um and there was another one where he says i can't do anything with this clown and then corrects himself and says sorry person um those are the two moments where the professional mask kind of slipped from biden a little um but i also feel that that will you shut up man bit was kind of it, it resonated it kind of said what everybody was thinking um in their head so i don't think that was a disastrous moment for joe and particularly when you when you compare it with everything Trump says, Biden's kind of allowed one or two of those. Um, if if Biden's main aim of this debate was to come out looking more presidential than Trump, I think he achieved that aim, even though he wasn't a hundred percent focused. Like his, even though he was, even though he wasn't a hundred percent professional, I think Biden's maybe main challenge coming into that debate, if I was to say you know, how people were framing it uh, was that Biden was seen before that debate as a doddery old man who might trip over his words and get lost in the middle of sentences. And Trump's interruption tactic might have been something that he's trying to throw Joe Biden off guard. So, you know, by constantly interrupting, by trying to get under his skin, he might be trying to force Biden into a mistake. I don't think he was. Um, I think he was able to control himself very well given everything that was going on so yeah that was the general tone of the debate and those two quotes thrown in uh what i feel on the subject of interruptions it was certainly trump causing more chaos than biden yeah yeah no i definitely got that Im impression but uh yeah I, <laughs> the, the main takeaway was this was not like a civil debate in all from all corners um as well so i i think yeah i i definitely feel like it was something that's um uh not necessarily as much of a negative for biden as you as as you might think from the descriptions we've heard but yeah i think it was just kind of a bit of a shame when you're kind of like oh well, maybe we'll have an interesting debate and it seems like it was a bit of a shambles so uh do you want to dive deeper into the topics covered in the debate there was quite uh we listed them last time actually there was quite a range of topics the big thing was um was COVID, uh, and that's a big thing that kind of has to be talked about. It's dominated the political conversation, as we said, for the last six, seven months. Um, 
And it's one that you'd expect Biden to do quite well on and Trump quite poorly on the fact that, you know, the majority of Americans seem to think that Trump has handled this crisis quite poorly. Um, it was that part of the debate went on for half an hour, um, dragged on where you had the most of the interruptions in there. Um, that was the part where you had this odd exchange between the two about who's smart. Um, Biden said he was smart, and then Trump kind of said, "Look, I graduated top of my class at Harvard. You were a flunky. Blah blah blah. I'm don't talk to me about being smart," which kind of took me back because, yeah, I mean, you would expect from the personas of the two that Biden would be the more qualified. Um, and even if Biden maybe didn't get the best grades at school, I feel that for two seventy-year-old plus men, maybe your grades at college don't mean everything. Now, maybe your life experience and how you've treated things um, would have more of a greater influence um, over the proceedings. So th that was just like a, a little bit that was these debates usually, even though they go on for hours, they can be cut down into memorable sound bites or 30 second to a minute moments. And they're the ones that will be discussed. And that was just a little one from that, which I think people would be surprised about the fact that Trump would choose that line of attack for Joe Biden. And once again, I don't know if it's because, you know, surprise, surprise, I'm not the biggest Trump supporter. But hearing Trump say that he's super smart, there's a real like, you struggle to believe him in a sense. I don't know if you get that. And I don't know if you've seen that clip, but it's kind of like, it shows the man's bravado, his confidence, you know, he clearly thinks that saying you know, basically sticking his thumb up and saying, no, 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 I'm smarter than you because I've got a piece of paper that says so is something that's going to persuade voters. And I'm not quite sure that's the tact that you want to take during a presidential debate. But as we've already mentioned, this isn't maybe the most uh, traditional presidential debate. Trump is trying to bring people down to his level. If that is a level that speaks to the American public more that's what we have to find out. But certainly from political commentators, I don't think it was taken too kindly, that, that line of attack. It's certainly a very childish uh, form of attack. It's the kind of thing that... And I think also it's... I'm, I don't want to say it's an American style of thing. I think Trump is a certain type of American. He's not indicative of all Americans by a long way. But it's, uh, it's definitely the kind of thing that in the UK would definitely be a negative. Uh, where, like, the, the idea of, you know, uh, one thing we're always kind of expecting to do is kind of diminish our accomplishments. And the idea that you'd walk around saying you're the smartest is like, I think kind of so antithetical to, you know, even, even with Boris getting up there and saying, we're going to have the best track and trace app and things like this, that that kind of bravado is not very common in the UK in general. And so it is, it's very weird watching something like that. It's both kind of childish and very boastful, I think. And I think that's probably because we're British, it's harder for us to understand that who that would appeal to. So, so another big story that's been in the news and was covered uh, in the debate, uh, Trump has been, well, I mean, there's been talk about mail, mail fraud, mostly from Trump, despite the fact there's very little evidence for it. Um, there's been lots of issues about sorting machines and stuff like that, people not being able to sign up for postal votes and things in the US. And also Trump kind of making it sound like uh, he's not going to hand over power easily. Kind of things a dictator says, if I'm honest. Uh, so how, how did that part of the debate go? Um, bearing in mind, since then, Trump has essentially said... Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot what he said. But he, he basically made the stocks plummet by saying something stupid as well, didn't he? Uh, yeah, I think it was based around the fact that he wouldn't... It, there's been a lot of talk about like a peaceful transition of power and that will Trump respect the results of the election, no matter what they are, which... As a presidential candidate, you're kind of expected to say, yes, of course, I respect American democracy. American democracy is great. It's the best in the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, Trump is not traditional in that sense. He's attacked kind of particularly mail fraud. As you pointed out, there's very little evidence at all that there is any form of mail ballot voting, you know, the, the mail fraud that will go on as a result of the um, increased number of mail ballots that are happening because, of course, because of COVID, people are less likely to go in person to the polls. They'll want to get that voting done early. Uh, the fact that Trump said that 
you know, he might not accept the result or that we might not know the result of the election for months afterwards because of the number of mail ballots. And if there are a number of mail ballots, that might cause a challenge in the Supreme Court and the, the Supreme Court might have to be the ones to determine the eventual result like they did in 2000 and um, between Bush and Gore. Uh, the other important thing about that, of course, is that Trump has rushed through his latest um, Supreme Court pick to replace um, RBG, um, which means that, yeah, if he's got a court that is five to three, sorry, six to three, because it will be yeah, nine judges, if it will be uh, six to three in favour of Republicans, that again increases the chances that Trump could win the election essentially like by the back door, by winning it in the courts rather than winning it on the number of ballots actually, you know, cast in his favour. So there was a lot of debate over that issue. And I think this is where fact checkers had a real field day kind of dismissing Trump's claims or saying that they are like largely, you know, if not completely untrue. Uh, but it's another chance for Trump to get across his message that he doesn't trust mail and maybe put a little bit of doubt in voters' minds about how they use that or maybe forcing people go to the polls rather than casting their mail ballot. Um, again, it's very like, I think it's bad form from this president to do it, but I don't think Trump particularly cares. It's, it's a tactic that may win him the election and he's willing to go down that road. Don't know if you want. Um, so continuing with things where you think it'd be obvious to get a president to come out and stand against it. Uh, I think there was a, a question to ask if they would condemn white supremacy. And given that Trump has had a fair number of white supremacists support him, even if he hasn't technically come out to say that he's for white supremacy, um, uh, how did that go down? Yeah, uh, pretty poorly. I think if I had to pick up one part of the night that really stuck around, it was this bit. This was the one that was being discussed days after the event. So uh, the moderator, I think, said to President Trump, basically says, do you contend white supremacists? And Trump basically said, uh, do you, yeah, sh uh, like, sure. Um, but there's a lot of people on the left that are also bad and tried to flip that whole question of law and order back onto, you know, oh, the left are just as bad, if not worse than white supremacists. And tried to talk about Antifa. The moderator doubled down and said, no, but you've got to condemn white supremacists. And Trump was like, who do you want to, me to condemn? Uh, the the Proud Boys he mentioned, which is a group I was unaware of until recently, until President Trump mentioned them. Um, but they are essentially quite a, a small white supremacist group that exist and are very pro-Trump. Um, Trump didn't condemn them, but he said for them to stand by. Yeah, that's a bit worrying, isn't it? Like they're his own militia. Yes, and... The fact that he did that, that then became like a rallying cry for them online. Kind of, they felt it was a subtle endorsement by the president of their practices. And the fact that the man just, it, it should be the easiest question, shouldn't it? Like, do you condemn white supremacy? Yes. The, the debate should move on. So maybe the question is like, why does Trump feel that he can't condemn white supremacists? It's because maybe part of his message is that he speaks to that group of people in America. I, I don't think it's too controversial to say that. Trump has consistently, when he's been asked, you know, particularly when you had the, uh, the event at Charlottesville, um, where one protester lost her life um, due to a sort of like a hit and run incident, even then the president was asked to condemn that attack and his response was, there are fine people on both sides, which is kind of like, shocking in itself the fact that he's been unable to move away from that line of thought two years down the line and that he seems to give he gives give the impression to white supremacists in america that president trump is on their side um because they are i'm not they're not all of trump's base but they are part of trump's base those people are very unlikely to vote biden i'm assuming um maybe that's why he's unwilling to condemn them entirely. Now, I think it is worth pointing out that in the days after the debate, President Trump did try to withdraw those comments and move on from them and said that he condemned white supremacy. But the fact that he couldn't do it in the moment when put on the spot, you know, that was in a debate, 
it's it's all that candidate, right? There's no team around him telling him what he should or shouldn't say. I, I feel that the statements that came out the day after were the Republicans looking at how much bad press those statements had got, how much of a vote loser it was for moderate Republicans who may be trying to justify still voting for Trump at the next election, that people might be pushed away from that. He was kind of forced to retract that. But the fact in the moment, he's, the fact that his gut reaction wasn't to say, yes, of course, I condemn white supremacy is really worrying. And I think that's the, yeah, that's the, the that was the biggest story that came out of those, those debates. I think if you looked at a 30 second clip and say, oh my goodness, that's really damaging for candidate X, that was the moment. And that was where I thought, it, for my, in my opinion, where Trump lost the debate, or at least was a potential big vote loser, particularly amongst lots of moderate Republicans. Um, well, one thing I just want to throw in there is a bit of levity while we're going through this is that um, uh, because uh, there is a Proud Boys hashtag that started to be used uh, by people who are presumably Proud Boys, um, the kickback from that on Twitter has been excellent with lots and lots of uh, gay men uh, who are, who are you know, in couples, often long, long, long term relationships, posting photos of themselves with just the hashtag Proud Boys to drown out the hate, uh, which has been really nice to see and also yeah it's just nice that uh people can push back against some of this horrible stuff that we see on the news at the moment the next thing that was discussed was the fact that trump has paid maybe a lot less tax than you might expect so yeah in, in the days running up to the debate we didn't cover it last time um but it was revealed that president trump um due to sources close to him and from a new york times article had paid $750 tax in the last year, which is stupidly low for a man who claims to have be a millionaire, if not a billionaire, and with all the property he has. Um, it just seemed farcical. And many people thought that would understandably play against the president because you have a lot of ordinary Americans going, well, I earn, you know, I'm in a mid-range salary or I earn quite a poor salary and I pay more of that, you know, more than that in taxes per year. Why is the president not paying more? Um so it was brought up and it was talked about, but essentially I think the response he gave in 2020 was pretty much the same as the one that he gave in 2016, which was uh, he said the IRS are currently auditing his taxes and they're doing, you know, a very long job on it because it's very complex. Uh when the results are out, he's happy to share them, but not now. Uh, which I think is a cop out. And again, although there wasn't really, there wasn't any knockout blow in the debates, it at least showed that this story does have traction, and I think will continue to have traction. Um, particularly if it if it comes out later. If that seven hundred. I think some Trump supporters have been able to dismiss that figure of 750 because it came from an unknown source in a New York Times article. And for Trump supporters, they don't feel the New York Times is a reputable source. Now, I think it's fairly, you know, I think it's fairly clear to say that probably is the case, even though we can't confirm it with 100% certainty. And the fact you can't confirm it is why Trump is able to have a degree of ambiguity and people can ignore it a little bit. Um, the, the Trump's taxes, like I said, was brought up in 2016. It didn't appear to be a massive vote loser, so maybe he's not that concerned about it. But actually putting a number to it, that $750 figure, I think that's another, that's just like a small nugget that will stick in voters' minds when they go to the polls. If you're going to be labeling, you know, if you're going to talk about things that came out of this debate or things that you'd label Trump with, the fact he didn't condemn white supremacists and he only pays $750 in tax a year. You gotta wonder, like, if the president does pay his taxes, why should I pay my taxes? You know, it, it could undermine a lot of things in American politics entirely. So, yeah, just I thought that bit was worth picking up on as as, as a small point and something that you might see run and run during this election campaign. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to I, I don't have much to add on that, but I would like to point people towards uh, Planet Money by NPR, which is a very good podcast. Anyway, they did an excellent episode on this, talking about. Something that I think, especially to British listeners, again, is a bit confusing about how the tax system works in the US because um, in the UK, everything's kind of automated. And if you do under or overpay tax, it just kind of gets sorted out most of the time. It's very rare that you get a giant check 
Normally, it's just they slightly change your tax code and your monthly payments change. And by the time the next years come around, you're, you're square, whichever way it is. Sometimes, sometimes it's like £500 in your favour and the government gives you a cheque. But most of the time, uh, they just sort it out. Um, whereas in the US, you have to file your own taxes and things can get interesting. Um, but the, kind of the key takeaways from that is it seems like uh, the way he writes off a lot of his taxes are to do with losses on his business. Um, so then the questions are twofold. One, are his businesses really losing that much money? Because he seems to live a quite lavish lifestyle for someone who has zero money. Um, and uh, equally, I think it's nearly all of his family get paid consultancy fees, which are therefore tax deductible. So basically, they're getting a salary from the business that then become tax deductible because it's seen as a, a business expense. But the question is how... I mean, again... We, we at this point without all the information we can only guess and speculate but it's basically given that uh that seems a bit dodgy how dodgy is it i suppose is the question um but 20 minutes of your life that i think would be very interesting if you're into this kind of thing um worth listening to so i think we're going to move on to our next topic so if that was kind of the anti-trump question of all of them i mean condemn white supremacy he may have dealt badly with it but he should have you know, saying, yes, I condemn white supremacy is an easy answer. The taxes were kind of focused on him. Uh, there was kind of a bit more of a focus in this next question, uh, kind of a bit more anti-Biden, um, because it was focusing on the military, which I think is something Trump is generally seen as doing quite well on, despite the fact initially when he took office, I know the various military people were concerned, um, but also that then turned into a comment about Biden's son, uh, Hunter Biden. Uh, yeah, I feel that this was maybe one of the lower points in the debate in terms of tone and i thought showed that trump was willing to do anything to try and score political points from his opponents so i believe the point with regards to the military was sort of brought up you know they were talking about law and order and the military etc cetera, etc cetera. um there have also been reports recently that trump is very trump views um like People who lost wars as losers, so doesn't feel that they should be like respected, and that was another story that broke from journalists or from generals that were very close to Trump, kind of um, talking about how he had toured like the the cemeteries in Normandy and didn't really get it because he felt that oh, if they died, then they were a, a loser, which is kind of like a terrible thing to say about somebody who's meant to have given their life for their country. Um, so Biden hit back with this and started talking about his son. Bo Biden, um, who had served in uh, Iraq um, as a, I don't remember if it's a general, but anyway, he'd, he'd served in, in Iraq um, and won a medal um, and also um, tragically had, had passed away from a brain tumour um, over like the past five years. So that's something quite close to heart. So you've got Biden saying like, you know, basically, I think you should support our troops more. My son, Bo, was a hero, continues to be a hero. Trump rushes that to the side quite brutally just by saying, I didn't know Bo, but I know Hunter. And Hunter Biden uh, went to the military as well and did loads of drugs and got a dishonorable discharge uh, and then did some bad stuff in the Ukraine, which you helped him with, which is Trump kind of dig up the dirt of all of that. When Trump was impeached, a lot of it was about his quid pro quo that he maybe gave to Ukraine. And during those conversations, Hunter Biden came up as a possible, like, uh, maybe the Democrats aren't so clean and all this as well. Um, that was Trump trying to distract from his impeachment back then. It appears that Trump isn't letting that go. And he's still wi willing to bring it up as an attack point. But I think the fact that he kind of dismissed Bo Biden and his memory so quickly, and there was such a turn there wasn't even a i think a more traditional presidential candidate wouldn't have gone for that attack line or if they did they would have said i respect bo biden and everything that he did for our country however i think hunter is blah 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 he didn't even do that he just kind of pushed biden's point away um and i felt biden's response to that felt quite heartfelt so he was saying that you know look he openly admitted that his son Hunter had had a drug problem um, and it was something that he'd worked on and got better at and that's all we can do. And, you know, as many Americans, I think his exact quote was, many Americans have also had drug problems and are overcoming them. This is something we can all, like, 
the message there was something this will all go overcome if we we have the support of our families um i I just felt that was that was another moment that stood out to me as very poor form from the president and another moment that might stick in people's minds that this is a man who's willing to you know no topic is off limits for this president he will go for your family whatever if it's trying to score political points over you um and yeah that was it was just a bit that made my eyebrows raise and thought, oh, I, I don't think that's going to play very well when it does the rounds and the news the next day. It's one of the things where you feel like you could have gone into this with a very reasonable strategy and Trump has definitely taken it too far. And I'm sure there are members of his base who are like totally on board with that. But it definitely feels like it's crossing a line. It's, it's, it's gone too far. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember. It was... I can't remember who was the vice president at the time, but it was against... There was a vice presidential debate which featured Dick Cheney, and I believe Dick Cheney's daughter is uh, is is a lesbian. So that was brought up by one of the Democratic candidates about her daughter's sexual orientation and how the Republicans are kind of against that. And yeah, you could see when that was brought up in the debate that that really offended Dick Cheney that his daughter would be used as a political point against him. And it was widely considered at the time that that was very poor form from the Democrats to even bring that up, like. You may know that information about a presidential or a vice presidential candidate's family, but leave the families out of this. This is about, you, you know, you and the other person and the other political party. You shouldn't be getting personal like that. So I think that's been proven to not be very effective. Uh, and yeah, Trump went there again. basically. So that was that first debate, uh, which, uh, as we say, was a bit of a mess. Um We've now also had the vice presidential debate, as I mentioned at the top of the episode. So how did that go? I mean, I, I think my takeaway was it was a bit calmer um, and uh, it definitely seemed more like what we would expect from a presidential debate. Uh, yes, yes, it was. And, and as a result, it was a bit more boring. And maybe that goes to show that even if we're looking for these civilised debates, when they are more civilised, they get talked about less. I mean. It's very hard to tell from a vice presidential debate because traditionally people don't really care about them, um, which is it is terrible because particularly in this case, one of these two people really could be the next president of the United States, depending on, you know, health and age, etc. And these are the two oldest presidential candidates we've got going up against each other. So it's more likely than ever that one of these might have to step into the role of president in the next four years. But as a result, the main thing that came out of that debate, or at least the thing that was being shared on social media the lot, was a fly landed on Mike Pence's hair and stayed there for about two minutes. Uh, Now, a fly also landed on Hillary Clinton during one of the debates in 2016, which has led some people to think that it is the same fly and it prophesizes who will lose the election. Um, (laughs) But the fact that that was the main talking point maybe tells you all you need to know about the content of that debate. I mean, I I will try and tell you more about the content, but yeah, the fact that that was the main talking point and people were going, huh, lol, a fly. Uh, Yeah, maybe tells you a bit more about how how dull that debate actually is and how how dull proper political discourse really is. I think it was more sedate, more what we'd expect, uh, as you say. But yeah, possibly that was a bit boring. On the flip side, news that wasn't at all boring uh, was the unsurprising fact that Trump actually contracted COVID, uh, which I think all of us could have seen coming, especially given the fact that he rarely wears a mask. Uh, I mean, like I think we discussed it as a big point the first time he wore a mask. It's kind of surprising he hasn't caught it before this point. Um, But yeah, how is that going to affect future debates? And also uh, how many of his staffers now have it? Because it was quite a lot last time I checked. Yeah, it seems to have ripped through the White House. So the one of the patient zeros or the main main that was name that was coming up um, when Trump said that he was first being tested for COVID was Hope Hicks, who is a political advisor who's very close to the Trump administration uh, and President Trump himself. Um, so yeah, you had the news that she had tested positive. Trump was isolating. Then you had the news that he actually had it, and there was a media furore. He's been to the hospital. He's been on oxygen. He's been on steroids. He's come back. That's um, sort of like a very condensed timeline. And obviously now he's had it, he should be isolating for 14 days, but he's still gone back to work in the Oval Office, which has led to reports of saying that, you know, 
he really should be put on rest and put out the way. But instead, because he's working in the Oval Office and is still potentially contagious, people now have to go in staffers in full PPE if they want to work with the president. Um, Trump's response to this has been uh, maybe what you'd expect, quite bullish. He's come out and said, oh my goodness, like I've survived COVID. I'm invincible now. Nobody should be afraid of it. We've got the best treatments available, um, which has led to frustration on many people who feel that no, you should really be tra- treating COVID seriously. Um, you know, you were a lucky one if you got out with, you know, the effects that you did. Um, but still, there are many people who haven't got out of it. 200,000 Americans or whatever the figure is, you know. So it's quite an odd message to be sending at this time. So that's a very potted view of Trump with COVID, which was like a massive thing for the past week. Um, What it's meant for the debates going forward is that clearly you can't have a debate with somebody who is who you know has tested positive and should be isolating. You can't have him in the same room as everybody else. Uh, So there has been a call to move for virtual debates. You know, the world is run on Zoom at the moment. Um, We've all lived that with the time. Why can't you have a presidential debate in that same manner? It came out today that Trump has rejected that call. Seemingly, um, I think he one of his claims was ah they can just cut me off whenever, and I don't want that. So you know this isn't the format we agreed to. Uh, you know they're just doing this because Biden. You know he thinks that Biden will appear better on a Zoom call if he's been able to be fed information from people. You know it's very different to if you're up on that stage by yourself. It's a lonely experience. You need to think on your feet up there. If it's on a Zoom call, maybe he can have people feeding him papers under the desk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are the reasons Trump has given for rejecting it. Uh, personally, I think it's a it's a bad move for the president. He is he's behind in the polls, okay, um, and he knows that he's generally unpopular. That first debate, although we didn't touch on it, polling after that suggested Biden won by about forty eight percent to forty one. Now. That might tell you a lot. That kind of reflects the general polling at the moment or where people stand. Like 41% is Trump's base. They'll probably like what Trump did. 48% probably represents the current Democratic base plus some others, moderates in the middle. So, you know, you can't read too much into that. But I think it's fair to say Trump is definitely on the back foot in this election. And if he's seen to be running away from a debate and more scrutiny, I think that can only play badly for him. The only people who will agree with that decision is Republicans and his base. And you can't win an election if you're just appealing to 41% of people. You need to get some moderates on your side. Um, And the fact that Trump is unable to do that or unwilling to at the moment, um, I don't think bodes well for his potential re-election chances. Now, there is a long time, and I think even Joe Biden has come out and said, look, that guy changes his mind every minute. So it's very possible we will get a debate in the end. This is classic Trump tactics of bluster, try and get a little bit more out of the format, try and, you know, negotiate it so he can interrupt Joe Biden whenever he wants on the Zoom call as well. I don't know, by raising his hand or randomly muting him for a laugh, Um, (laughs) putting putting a distracting background on, something like that. Um, Trump with his Mar-a-Lago behind him. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, the fact that... The fact that he's had COVID obviously will not only affect the format of the debates, but I think will also frame the next conversation that they have on um, COVID-19 and the response. It does appear that Trump is far more uh, bullish about this. um, And some people are saying it might just be the steroids that he's on at the moment. And once they wear off, he might crash pretty bad. But we'll see. Um, There's always a... Uh, an October surprise, something that happens in the weeks running up to the election. I don't think anybody quite expected it to be the president gets COVID and might die. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock. Um, And especially there was the bit where obviously, I mean, it was the same when, you know, it's the same when anyone gets it who's who's heart, like, like they were saying, he's got it. And they were giving very little information. Obviously, people were like, oh, it's really bad. And it did seem like maybe some of the treatment options were a bit weird, but he seems to be out the other side of it okay, Um, which, again, isn't surprising when you have access to pretty much the best healthcare in the world because you're the president. So, um, yeah, 
it's not uh, surprising that he survived. Um, but yeah, it was a bit weird for a day or two there where, you know, if that had happened and there's all this talk about what happens if someone dies running for, for for office and all of this kind of thing. And it was it got very dark there for a little while. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, and as you say, an October surprise. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get another. Uh, it's only the 8th of October, so we've got time for more weird things to happen. But yeah, uh, we'll see how that pans out. So I think we will uh, take a quick break here to give you an advert for another show on the network. Hi. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you took the schoolyard conversation of which one of my favourite fictional characters would win in a fight? Well, wonder no more. Join me, Chris, and my co-host Matt every other Sunday for Mishmash Mayhem, and you can find out. So we're going to move on to our quick polls update. Um, Obviously, uh, we've just been talking about the debates. How have they affected the polling? Um, So our first uh, poll we're going to look at is the, um, the presidential national poll so the lead here without the the poll tracker we follow at 538 it's gone up for biden and it is increasing to go up and and trump's you know dropping down Uh, it's now at plus 9.5 percent um i think if you see uh some of the stories that get go out on the media it will be like it will sound like that's quite small because there was a particular poll that found a 16 percent uh win for biden but this is why we always say you can't take one poll on its own really um, because if you were going on based on that poll, you'd be like, well, Biden's definitely going to win it. But 9.5% is it's not an insurmountable uh, difference, but it definitely looks like Trump is trending downwards and Biden is trending upwards right now. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that goes to show that the maybe this is, an, this is a very odd general election, sorry, very odd presidential election, because usually you have people who are, there are a lot of floating voters who haven't made their mind up about either candidate. And I think that was very true in 2016 when you had what was perceived of a disliked candidate in Hillary Clinton and an unknown quantity in Donald Trump. Four years onwards, I think people have made their mind up on Trump. And you know, that's leading to a lot of people, you know, the polls being relatively steady. So this lead of about nine points for Biden, um, you can go back to about, July and see that Biden was in roughly the same space there. And that Trump's base, although it kind of has gone up and maybe was narrowing, Trump peaking at around about 43%, 43.5, it's never really got over that mark. So essentially, if I was the president, I would be worried about these polls. This suggests that there isn't much of a path back for him, or it's going to take something catastrophic on the Democrat side to happen if President Trump is going to stand a chance. Now, I say this with all the caveat of last time when we had this an election, we were all sure that Trump was going to lose. And, you know, oh, surely Hillary's going to win. Clinton, you know, that these polls will sort themselves out. I think back in 2016, they were a lot closer and a lot more volatile. Uh, and you had things like Hillary's emails bringing up these big bombshells in October that maybe tipped things in favour of Trump at just the right time. Uh, I feel pollsters maybe will have learned from their mistakes in 2016 and how they led people to believe that Hillary was going to win when that wasn't the case. Uh, And I think it means that Biden's message uh, going into the last few weeks of this campaign will be ignore the polls. We haven't won this thing yet get your head down and keep going. We need to finish this off. Because there was a feeling maybe back in 2016 that there was an air of complacency or inevitability about Hillary's presidency that took everybody by surprise. I don't feel you're going to have that same level of complacency in 2020. They can't afford it. I don't think people could... I don't think the Democrats could afford to have another shock like they did in 2020. Can you imagine? If you're nearly 10 points up in October, losing from there, um, you know, even if they win the popular vote again, but not the Electoral College, um, it would be seen as a massive failure of campaign management to throw that type of lead away. So, yeah. But but then again, <laughs> the, the, the result of 2016 still has me holding back saying, if this was any other election, if this was me looking at 
a UK election, I might be confident in saying, yeah, no, like the person who is 10 point ahead has got this. Uh, even now, I'm like holding back on saying that because you don't want to jinx it. No, I think I think people are like people are more cautious about polls, and it's reasonable given the last few years where people maybe were overly reliant on the polls. Uh, and yeah, we know polls aren't perfect for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the things that definitely happened the last time round was that supporters of Trump, it, it's similar. Like similarly, some people there, there are outspoken people on Brexit. But some people were like, oh, actually supporting this doesn't look good. But internally they do. So they might not answer a poll truthfully. The only truthful poll, as we always say, is the actual vote. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's still the possibility that there's, you know, some hidden information there. But it is quite a big lead. So, you know, I think I think I think most people are saying it's looking like it's going Biden's way based on this. But there's still a month to go. Anything could happen. Um, the other thing I just want to touch on briefly is the election forecast, which we touched on before. Very good and interactive. And uh, yeah, this currently has Biden winning 85 in 100 uh, possible uh, scenarios, um, which I think is stronger than it's been before, but not massively. I think it was maybe in the 80s before. You'd have to listen to our older episodes. Uh, I don't off the top of my head have a comparison. But yeah, I think that's just there to say it does look like. Uh, they're going to win that. Um, and also note that the US Senate uh, Democrats slightly favoured to win and the US House Democrats clearly favoured to win. So it looks like it could be a return to Democrat power, which you would generally expect when a Democratic president comes in. But um, it is harder for them to win the Senate uh, nowadays. Uh, there are some good podcasts I can link people to that I think will be in the show notes as well, talking about how um, uh, they did a not vote stuffing, but like by focusing money on smaller elections in the US, the Republicans were able to take over a lot more local government. And then that in turn affects people voting on the bigger seats like the Senate, not necessarily the presidential votes, but um, other votes. So it's very interesting talking about how uh, political advertising is done and things like that. Um, and what happens when a big national campaign comes in unannounced to a local level campaign and throws a spanner in the works. Yeah, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think other than, you know, just, I know John Oliver did a very good piece on uh, the Senate and how Republicans have control of that and how uh, <laughs> the Senate is yet another example of voter suppression in a way or making, you know, how minorities' votes are suppressed in odd ways because the fact that California has the same number of senators as many like midwest states um it, it means that a vote for a senator in california is worth far less than a midwest one more minorities tend to live in democratic states and the more popular states than the republican ones and then you've got places like um is it puerto rico i think uh, puerto rico is the place that's basically a state except it's not <laughs> And they keep having um, elections on whether, sorry, they keep having votes on whether they should be allowed in. But obviously, the actual al allowing a state in is only is reliant on um, uh, a vote in the Senate. And there's a whole push and pull between, like, America is supposed to be this big welcoming place that wants more people. Puerto Rico is already basically America, so why shouldn't they? But then the Republicans are like, well, we can't allow in another state. Uh, because they'll vote Democrat, and that's not okay. And uh, then the Democrats are like, well, we're not being very democratic, etc. And similar discussions are held about whether people in DC should be able to vote. Um, but that's a bit more constitutional, because there's a... I, I can't remember the exact terminology, but there's a provision in the Constitution that says something along the lines of... that the, the capital should be separate uh, in some way, or it might be an amendment, but oh, yeah, basically that the capital should not have voting rights but there are a lot of people living around dc who aren't represented and so it's uh the famous line is taxation without representation um so yeah i i think there's there's definitely some upcoming battles especially if the democrats take control of both parts of um of uh congress it will be interesting to see what happens in the next few years on those kind of issues because you could see them trying to push those forwards because it would help them, but also I think there is a good, strong democratic argument for both of those. Cool. Uh, well, as always, Rob, thank you for joining me. Um, 
You can find us in all of the usual places, whether that be patreon.com forward slash TTSS, where you can give us some shiny, shiny dollars uh, so that we can keep talking about this stuff and pay for our web hosting. Uh, shiny new microphones. They're so shiny. Allow me to talk like this. Um, and uh, stuff like that. You can go to our website at parliamentary.observer where you can find all the show notes and you can comment on uh, the episodes themselves directly. You can go to YouTube and find us there. Uh, and you can find us on Facebook, Reddit, all the various places, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, come, come and chat with us. Uh, recommend us to your friends. All the usual things we ask you. Always great to hear from our listeners uh, who enjoy the show and especially anyone who's joining us on Amazon Music because uh, we saw a spike from people over there. I think I mentioned that last time as well, but yes. Hello, everyone. Without further ado, I don't think there's anything else left for me to say other than it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Bye. 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 Bye.